All right, I'm going to continue on. Before I do, I want to mention this to you guys. Uh, I'm going to send you these two URLs. My counterparts at St. Louis are both excellent instructors. All right, Mr. Smith, who teaches third and fourth semester, he is unlike any teacher I've ever seen in that he's kind of a, an IT sponge. He just soaks stuff up and he's able to spit it back and, he, and retain everything. I, I wish I had the, some of the abilities that he has. And Mr. Gudmus did much the same way. He's, he's kind of more folksy than Mr. Smith is, but they both do an excellent job. I want you to learn this stuff. You know, whether you learn it from me or you get help from them or you get help from YouTube videos or whatever, but I just wanted to show you that as an example, because, you know, every, every time, you know, when you teach, you teach towards your strengths, whether that's a good thing, bad thing, right thing, it's just the way that it is. But looking in here, now you'll notice that Mr. Mr. Smith, there is C-sharp programming fundamentals, all right? And I'm not, no, I'm not there. That's him right there. And he's got a whole bunch of things that are in here. So if you didn't like the job, for example, that I just did going over object-oriented or interfaces or whatever, those are his lectures are there, all right? Mr. Smith is much more business-like. All right, and he just, boom, he throws stuff at you. But uh, when students come up with questions, he can just answer them. Or a lot of times I'd have to say, I don't know, but I'll find out for you. He just knows. They're both excellent instructors. So, I mean, just something else you might want to take advantage of or might not. All right, but again, I'm going to send you both of these URLs. All right, that's for the other, that's for later. So let's jump in. Chapter 15 starts on page 477, shorter chapter. The chapter starts by showing you how to use interfaces. As it says, they're similar to abstract classes, but they're, are, they're also different. Then they'll talk about how to use generics. Everybody here knows what generic is. So if I want to make a generic list, that wouldn't necessarily be a list of products or a list of integers, or you know, it could be just a generic list. All right. So we'll look at that towards the end. We're going to concentrate, I believe, at least more on interfaces. Now, one thing when when you have inheritance, I've shown you this picture before, but I want I want you to see this. So in the example I gave you before, let's say we had dog, and I'm going to come here and I'm going to say poodle. And I'm going to say, what is this? Uh, golden Retriever. All right, supposedly, from what I hear, those two are put together, and that's your Golden Doodle. Now, maybe I'm wrong. I don't really care. But you understand what I'm saying here? Everybody understand? Does it also make sense to you that a Golden Doodle has two parents? Does that make sense? All right. You can say, yeah, I understand that. I have two parents. I get that. We, we all either do or we all did have two parents, all right, whether you realize it or not, all right? The point is you can't do this in C sharp. You can't have a class that inherits from two different classes. Did you hear me? You cannot do that. That's not built, written into C sharp. You cannot do that in Java. You can do that in a language like C++. That's one reason C++ is oftentimes used, especially for games, because you can use multiple inheritance. What you get in here is what's referred to as a diamond effect, all right? And you can't have that in this language. Now, so, okay, so I mean, I want, I don't want, I, I do want this, I understand, I can't help. So I come down here, and there's my golden doom. But you know what? Darn it, there's still stuff in here I want to give it from that class. Can you do that? Not directly, but you can create what's called an interface, which looks a lot like an abstract class, but where you can only inherit from one class, you can inherit, inherit from zero or more interfaces. You can inherit from multiple interfaces. 
So you want to take everything that you can and put it into a class. But if there's stuff that really doesn't belong in that class, but you want to be able to provide it, you put it in one or more interfaces. So if I wanted to do this, and let's interfaces by, you don't have to do this, but by convention, they start with I. So let's just say I made an interface that I called IGR, or I Golden Retriever. You with me? Okay. Then I came in here and I said public class class golden doodle is a poodle. Then I could put in there comma I G R. See that? So I'm saying that it inherits a class and it also inherits an interface. You can do that. And again, I could put another comma and have another one and another comma and another one. All right. You don't have to do this, but it provides a mechanism for you to provide even more information for classes. All right. So as it says, we'll get an, in an introduction into those, talk about some of the interfaces that are used in .NET, show how to create an interface, how to implement an interface. Again, I just showed it how you do it here. In Java, as I mentioned before, you use the word extends with inheritance. Then you say the word implements with an interface. So it, it's done the same way, except that you know, the, the, the uh, verbiage for it is a little bit different. All right, then we'll talk about a product class that implements the iClonable interface and then how to use an interface as a parameter. Then we get into generics. I'm not going to read these to you, all right? But we're going to talk about generics. I'm going to be more concerned in here with the um, with interfaces than I am with generics, all right? So as it says, some languages like C++ that I mentioned in Perl, you can have multiple inheritance. C Sharp doesn't support it. But it does support, as it says, a special type of coding element known as an interface. All right. So in some ways, an interface is similar to an abstract class. So let's look at it. First of all, again, notice it starts with a capital I. You don't have to do that. That means two things. First of all, you should think of it that anytime you see a class that starts with I, it's not a class, it's an interface. Notice the word class is not there. It's saved as an interface. So this one would be called iDisplayable.cs. Does that make sense to you? But it would be an interface. The other thing is, really, if you're creating your own classes, you probably shouldn't start them with the letter I. Because other people would misconstrue that and think that it's an interface. All right. So here is our product class. Remember, product is up at the top. This implements the displayable all right, interface. So they took the get display text and they moved it out of here as a method and they put it into here. And then they're overwriting it down here. See that? Now, and again, this whole thing, the, 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 the bottom line is this. I don't know, have, have you ever seen where you can, you, you can go to a store and buy one of those paint by number kits? You know what I'm talking about? All right. So the idea is, it says, you know, this area of this person's face is, maybe it's the hair, and it, you use the number three because it's gray, etc. That doesn't mean you can't make it green. You could, but if you want it to look right, there's a certain protocol that you're supposed to follow. All right. The problem is when you start working with object-oriented programming, there's no agreed-to protocol to follow. All right. When we get into the Java part, Next, those you, you three here next spring, I'm going to show you how to create an interface and why you would re create one, etc. All right, some languages they're either not available or you never hear about them, so you probably thought they're, they're not even available. All right, so both interfaces and abstract classes provide signatures. So, what does that mean? Well, look, there's a return type, there's a name, and there's the arguments that it needs, okay? All the members of an interface are automatically abstract. So everything that's in there is automatically abstract, which means 
everything that's in there must be overridden by any class that implements the interface. You don't use the word virtual. You don't have to use the word overrides. You just do it. A class can inherit only one class, but it can implement zero or more interfaces. Interfaces can't declare static members, well, whereas abstract classes can. Remember, if something is static, you only create one of them, and every instance of the class shares that one copier, so to speak, whatever you want to call it. So an interface, as it says there, consists of a set of signatures for one or more methods, properties, indexers, or events. It does not provide any implementation. You can write non-abstract methods in an abstract class, and you can even implement them. All right, You cannot do that in an interface. Again, by convention, interface names begin with a capital I. To implement an interface, the class must name the interface on the class declaration, and it must provide everything that's been put into the interface. Again, I'm not saying that totally makes sense or that doesn't make sense. All right. So what would you really want to put into an interface? I mean, one thing that people oftentimes put into interfaces are their constants. They put that in there so that those are able to be used by different classes. All right. That might make sense. So some of the interfaces defined by the .NET framework, notice it says it defines hundreds of interfaces. Fortunately, most of them are intended to be used by other framework classes. It says, as a result, you don't have to learn them all. No, you probably will learn very few of them. It's another one of those kind of things you only learn what you need. You know, it's the old, what is it, the 80-20 the the rule? You learn 20% of the stuff that you use 80% of the time. All right, the rest you have to look up. All right. So it says the first table in the figure lists four general purpose .NET interfaces. I clonable, I comparable, I convertible, and I disposable. Of these, it says the one you're most likely to implement is I clonable, which lets you create objects that can produce copies of themselves. Why would you want to do that? All right. You're basically letting the, the thing self impregnate itself, whatever you want to call it, there may be a reason for doing that. It says it consists of a single method called clone that returns a copy. It says you'll see an example of that of a product class that implements that interface a little bit later. And it says the other three are commonly used in .NET interfaces. iComparable, as it mentioned, provides a standard way to compare an object with another object. We may have talked about this before. I honestly don't remember. But this is, I just want to show you something. We created an app. Probably have you guys create the same thing. In, in uh, this semester, we created an app in the uh, Android programming class. Okay? What we have in here is this. It's got all of our presents. So, for instance, this would be a picture of, not good, but a picture of George Washington. Okay, then we've got here, George Washington, so first name and last name. Of course, it'll all be in there. And then when he served, I don't know when it is, 1706 to 1750. Then underneath that, we've got John Adams. All right, and, you know, 1716 to 1720, 24. You get the idea? All right, but... Then what we did was we came up here and we added a menu. Right now it looks like three dots until you click it. When you click it, it provides you the ability you can sort by last name ascending. You can sort by last name descending. You can sort by what I call serves, you know, when they serve, ascending, or you can sort by when they serve descending. Does that make sense to everybody? Well, the way that you do this, you can write your own methods, and that's the way it used to be done. When I was in your shoes, a lot of this stuff wasn't pre-written like this. You had to write it. 
But now what you can use in Android is something called comparators, where you compare each thing and you work its way down and you change its position if necessary. So if I chose sort by when they served descending, Biden would be at the top. Does that make sense? And Washington would be at the bottom. The reason I'm telling you that is to do that, we use what's called a comparator. And a comparator compares two things. And it returns either this or this or this. All right. If the first one is in the right order already, it returns typically a negative one. If you compare two things and they're equal, it returns zero. If you compare two things and the first one is greater than the second one, it, it gives you back a one. The reason I'm telling you that is that's kind of how I comparable that's right here pretty much works the same way. It allows you to, to compare things and not something simple like integers, which are not hard to compare, but something like an object. All right. So that's what's in there. There's also I enumerable and I enumerator. All right. It says it provides a standard mechanism for iterating your way through items of a collection. So in other words, it's real easy to create an array. We've done this at 25 numbers and, and iterate your way through them. It's much harder to create a thing of objects that's got people's names, and maybe pictures and other stuff and iterate through that. All right. So that's how you use these. All right. So you can read the descriptions, et cetera, that are in here your, it, yourselves. The one that you'd be most likely to use, again, would be iClonable. And again, they're only showing three or four of probably what are more than 100 possible things. You want to learn more, you know, just go out to docs.microsoft.com. All right, the old, uh, you know, where, where you get all the information and just, just put in there. All right. Type in .NET interfaces and you're going to get a lot of hits. All right. So now we're talking about how to create your own interface. And as it says, as you can see in the index here or in the diagram, you declare an interface using the interface keyword followed by a name. Within the body, you can declare one or more methods, properties, and events. It says, although these look similar to a class, there are three important differences. All right. Number one, because an interface doesn't provide an implementation, the declarations for the get and set always end in a semicolon. Second, you can't code access modifiers, no public, private, etc. All of them are considered to be public and abstract. That may be another reason you do want to or you don't want to use an interface. All right. Third, interfaces cannot define static members, so you cannot use the static keyword. So you come in here, you know, and like we've done before, you right mouse click on the name of the project, not the solution, but the project, you choose add and you choose new item. And one of the ones that's in there, it might be right after class, I don't remember, is interface. All right. So here's an example, an interface that only has a method in it. Here's an interface that has, as it says, two methods, just get set, like they said, and a property. To use an interface, you do what's called implement that interface. And again, looks very similar to what we just talked about. So right there. I don't know if there's a rule if you're both going to inherit a class and implement an interface. I don't know if the order matters or not. I always put my classes first, then my, inter or my, my class name first, then my interfaces. Do you have to do that? I, I guess I've never even tried doing it the other way, so I can't tell you for sure. All right. Now, what they're showing you here, it says class test colon iClonable. And it immediately pops up with an error and it's letting you know, hey, iClonable, if you use iClonable, that interface, you must put in this method. So it'll add this for you if you want it to. Now, that's not going to be correct. It just throws a not implemented exception. So you want to remove that line and put in there whatever you'd want to put in there. 
All right. Again, to declare a class that implements one or more interfaces, type a colon after the class name. If a class inherits another class, it says you must include, okay, it says here, you must include the name of the inherited class before the name of the interfaces. So you must put the class name first. I thought that's what it all was. I wasn't sure because I've never tried doing it the other way. So, all right. After you enter the name of an interface, you can automatically generate stubs. Have the system do that for you, just as it showed by clicking on the light bulb that's over here. All right. So they come up with this product class. As it says, it's going to implement the iClonable interface. So let's look at what they're talking about here. It says, now that you've seen the basic skills, this figure presents an example of the product interface that implements iDisplayable and iClonable. All right. The product class begins by declaring three properties, code, description, and price. That sounds familiar. Then after the constructor, the getDisplayText method provides the implementation of the iDisplayable interface. That was that generic one that they showed a couple pages back. Finally, the clone method creates a new product copies the code, copies the description, copies the price from the current product to a new product and returns it. All right. The second code example, as it says there, illustrates how you can use the clone and get display methods of the product class. So let's just take a look at them. All right. So again, you'll notice that in this case, this is product. This is the base class at the top. And we're saying that that product class implements all right the i displayable interface and the i clonable interface okay and since it does it must have that clone that's in here must be in here all right and for the displayable it's using the get display text all right so again they're showing you different ways of doing the same thing, all right? So now they're, they're not even talking in here about having a book and an, uh, with an author or having a software with a version. They're just talking about a product, a generic product class that implements two interfaces, meaning you have to add these two different methods in here, and then they're showing you how they can be used. As I said, there's no paint by numbers here. There is no one size fits all, all right? Two people can look at the same thing and come up with markedly different ways of implementing it. They could both be 100% correct, all right? So they mentioned here, as it says, figure 15.6 shows how to use an interface as a parameter to a method. In other words, how would you want to pass it into a method, all right? It says to do that, you code the name of the interface as the parameter type as shown in the first example. So notice what they're doing. They're passing an I clonable, which is what they had before, and they're calling it OBJ. All right. Why might you want to do that again? Possibly to use some of the stuff later on in there that's available in I clonable. Says the second example shows you how to code a method named write the console that this that accepts the i displayable interface as a parameter. So that's this one right here. So you are going to be able to display whatever you know was in there. All right, and you'll make sure that what they're having for its separator, remember it needs a separator, is a new line. And then when you're all done, a new line at the end. When you declare a method that accepts an interface as a parameter, you can pass any object that implements that interface to the method. This, again, this is as heavy as it gets in this class, in my opinion. All right. Now, they mentioned in here, it says the key point is the create list method doesn't know what type of object it's cloning, and it doesn't care. Again, the idea is we're abstracting away, and we're only letting everything that's in our program know what it needs to know in order to be able to do its job. No more, no less. 
All right. Finally, it says, this example illustrates an even larger point. In short, as they mentioned here, a product object can be thought of as either an iClonable or an iDisplayable object. As a result, you can, you can supply a product object anywhere you expect there to be an iClonable or an iDisplayable. All right, so in other words, what you're doing by this is, in, in at least in a way, you are making what you're working with even more versatile. All right. All right, that's the first half of the chapter. So let's jump into the second half here. If we are, oh, we're fine. All right. So as they mentioned, in Chapter 8, we learn how to work with generic collections like list, sorted list, etc. The one we've been concentrating on almost completely has been list. We've had a list of integers. We've had a list of products. We have a list of this or that. There's also a sorted list, which is like a list, but it's sorted. That makes sense, and you tell it what to sort it on. We've talked about stacks, which are last in, first out, and I gave you the example of the deli trays. All right, and we talked about queues, which are first in, first out. And we use the example of a line waiting to go see our security guy or something like that. It says most of the time you can use these or other collections whenever you need to work with a collection of objects. But there may be times you need to use generics so you can define your own generic collection to add some functionality that is not available from one of these. All right. Or from something that's available in the .NET framework. So again, just like, we haven't really done this, but just like in C Sharp, you can write your own exceptions. So if you don't want to use one of the built-in exceptions, you can write your own. But you've got to create a class. It's got to basically uh, inherit from the exception class, and you've got to add the functionality to it. And I even gave you examples of when you might use this. You know, what we've done, if you remember back when we looked at that example that we had for the miles per gallon, if you left nothing there, that was an argument exception, all right? If you put in a number, for example, for miles driven that was less than one or greater than a thousand, we did an argument out of range exception. Technically, that's not the right exception, all right? Technically, we should make our own exception. You know, we could make our own and call it invalid, invalid miles driven entered or inputted. In much the same way, you can create your own class. So as it says, part of figure 15.7 shows a class named custom list that defines a generic collection. It says, although this class is simple, and again, as always, simple is a relative term. All right, you look at this and you might say, not to me, it ain't. And I get that, all right? It doesn't provide any additional functionality that improves upon list. It shows the basic principles. Now, to do this, you got to do some weird stuff. It says to start, a data type variable named T is declared within the angle brackets immediately after the class name. The variable, as it says, represents the data type. So when you look at this, that looks a little weird, in my opinion. T is just, it, it's a standard. That's what people use, T for type, I believe. So we're creating our own custom class right there of what type our own type all right it's going to be a new list again everything they're saying that they put in here they could have done by just using a regular list but they put this in here like this to show you that it's also possible to create your own type now i haven't looked at your next test but I, i'm making this promise and that is if there's something like this in there i'm taking it out all right, because the, the majority, if not all of your next test, at least the majority, you may have to add an interface, I don't know, but the majority of your next test will be on the chapter we just went over. All right. So as it says, you use generics to define a type safe collection that can accept elements of any type. All right. To define it, it says you code angle brackets after the name of the class, you specify the type parameter within these. So what I'm doing, for lack of better words, is I'm creating my own custom type right here. And I'm saying what it can do. Then I can go back, and, and instead of creating something of type list, I can now create something of type custom list, as an example. And 
and they show you some code. Again, it's not going to look really any different from what they did before because all they did was copy in most of the stuff they had already in a regular list. So as it says, the generic custom list works just like you know, the stuff that was discussed, discussed earlier in the book. It says the output assumes that a product class includes the two string method. And what if it doesn't? You're going to get an error. That's one thing, good, bad, or indifferent about this. If the system, since you're all working on, like I said, basically kind of worked off the .NET API, if you want to call it that, that if you do something and you do it and you leave something off, you put something in the wrong order, or you put in too much, it's expecting five and you give it 10 type of an idea, the program's just going to break. All right, then they talk about some of the other generic interfaces that are that exist in .NET. I'm not going to read these to you. All right. If you were to get a job as a full-time .NET programmer where you were doing C-sharp, you'd come into contact with these. Either you'd be creating them or you'd be maintaining some code that already has them. I can virtually guarantee that. So they got a little explanation here if you want to read that of each one of those. All right. Then they talk about how to implement the iComparable interface. Okay. So here's, as it says, this is a class that implements the iComparable interface. So notice if it returns positive one, P1 is greater. If it returns negative one, P1 is less. If it returns zero, the two are equal. All right. So this, again, would be one way that you could come in and do the equivalent of writing like a sort routine on objects. And what makes that even better is you could also pass in here what it was you wanted to sort on. Just like I gave you that example of the presidents. All right. Okay. Constraints here. It says, as you work with generic classes, you may occasionally encounter situations where you need to restrict the possible data types that a generic class can accept. For instance, you might want to see that it, it, it has only reference types, not value types. All right. It says, to do that, you can code a constraint, as they show right here. I have never even gotten so into this that I've created a constraint. I'm not even going to lie to you. All right. I've done some work with some with the i comparable and a little bit with the i enumerable all right the book that we used to use here it had examples more examples than they have in our book and then they asked you to do some stuff with sorting and the like and again it was the kind of thing that typically people either got it boom well, i ain't hard or they just didn't get it even if they saw a working copy of it they still didn't get it so again when you define a generic class, you can use constraints to restrict the data types. Okay. All right. We're, get, we're coming to the end here. It says how to implement the I enumerable interface. All right. It says the for each only works on generic collections that implement the I enumerable. Again, why do you want to use for each? All right. Because it automatically loops through a list for you. You don't have any testing to do. You don't have any incrementing or decrementing to do. All right. It says there the easiest way to do that is to code a for each U loop, rather. All right. Now, notice what it says. You can also use, when you do that, the word yield. I've never done that either. All right. So they mention here, the for each loop only works on generic collections that implement the I enumerable. All right. When implementing the get enumerator method, you can use the yield keyword to return the current element that implements basically what you're looking for. It's kind of like, oh, I found it. Do a break and get the heck out. We, we've done a little bit of that in our classes, haven't we? When you found something that matched, you basically go, oh, good, this equals this. So if what's in the text box equals what's, you know, if it's equal to what the getter is, boom, you just return, you just, re, you say, okay, I found it, and you return. All right, it's kind of a similar thing. 
but you're able to work with much more complex type of objects to do that. All right. Figure 1512, as it says, shows you how to define a generic interface. All right. They call it here iGeneric Persistible. The code for this interface provides a standard way for a business object to read itself from or write itself to a data source such as a database. So what they're showing in here is how to write a generic method that will allow something to either, depending on how generically it's written, show itself on screen, maybe with a message box, show itself on screen, maybe in text boxes or labels, show it or put its contents into a file, or possibly grab its contents from a file, put its contents in a database, or possibly get its contents from a database. All right. So as it says, when defining an interface, you can use generics just as you do with any class that uses generics. Okay. And that's it. All right. All right. I'm going to stop here. And we've been going 36 minutes just like we did before. It is 1037. I'm going to just give you a mini break and I'm going to start up at 1045. All right, so please come back then.